How about that? Yes, okay, Pastor. Okay, sorry about that. I uh, realized my battery was going down, so I had to quick hook up the computer so I wouldn't run out of battery. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you that uh, we're able to come together for a few minutes again this morning in India. And I just ask that the Holy Spirit would be very present, speaking, Father, and, and, and encouraging us and helping us, Father, to understand what goes on in our lives. So make me, Father, your worthy representative. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Many years ago, now I, I guess it would have been maybe around 2000, so that goes back quite a ways, uh, maybe more than 20 years ago, I was asked to uh, speak for a camp meeting in Michigan on prayer, and I was certainly willing to do that. Uh, I had been uh, uh, the head of the prayer meeting at the Pioneer Memorial Church and, uh, and doing a lot of prayer with people and been asked to speak in prayers. And, and so a pastor asked me if I would, uh, you know, give a short talk on prayer. And I was willing, but before the camp meeting began, I became aware of some young women who had come together to pray for a husband who had uh, left with another woman uh, obviously causing all kinds of heartbreak and problems for the family. And these uh, two married women, younger married women, decided that they would pray until that errant husband came back. And praise God, they were praying. It was actually on a Sunday that they began praying. And they fasted and prayed that day. And, you know, at some point in the evening, uh, one of the, the, the women said to the other, you know, I just feel in my heart that God has answered our prayers. And we, we can thank the Lord for what he's done and go home. And sure enough, the next day, the husband came home repentant. It was a, an amazing miracle. And it struck me that instead of my taking the time at camp meeting, I really should uh, uh, allow uh, these uh, two ladies to share their testimonies. And I remember that I was challenged by someone, which was a bit surprising. They said to me, uh, Dan, why would you share those kinds of stories? Because you're going to give people false hopes that if they have problems, they can pray and, and, and God will, will deal with their, their problems. And I felt very sad about that because I really believe that God has given us a gift in prayer uh, that really will yield uh, a great deal. Now, in the book of James, James chapter, um, you know, it, it, talk, it, it talks about, it, it asks the question, you know, why we don't have, it's in, in uh, James chapter 4, verse 2, it says, You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight in war, yet you do not have because what? You do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask and miss. And so we're strongly, strongly encouraged that we should be praying. Um, and so, you know, the Lord got me to thinking about what this was about. Why was it that, that for example, for these two ladies praying together, God had, had answered their prayers in such an amazing way. And yet others sometimes pray about the same things and they don't seem to get an answer. And um, the Lord for whatever reason, and, and I cannot explain how it happened, the Lord impressed me deeply with the story of the exodus from Egypt. And it's, a, it's something that I've thought about very much ever since then. The Lord struck me with a couple of things that I think are of real value, as all of you pray here on the 24-7 United Prayer Line. When you look at the story, first of all, it helps to understand that when they came with Joseph, that would have been more than 200 years before, they came at the invitation of Pharaoh. He was deeply grateful for uh, the work that Joseph had done in protecting their country from a terrible famine. And so they came and they were settled in, in Ramses, the land of the Pharaohs, the best land in all of Egypt. And in gratitude for what Joseph had done, they lived there tax-free. They had the best living of, of anyone. They lived there tax-free for over 200 years. And because uh, Joseph had said that they were shepherds, they were, they were given a, a place where they weren't really bothered by other people. And this was all at God's work, and they were given kind of a secluded place. And there they were for, for several hundred years. But eventually, the prophetic clock was moving towards their departure. And, and, uh, and they, during that time, had become more Egyptian, really, than they were uh, followers of God, as they would need to be back in the promised land. And so God allowed at that time 
a pharaoh to come along that didn't know Joseph. He was paranoid and he worked very, very hard to uh, make their lives more difficult because he wanted to weaken them and he wanted to cause them to be weaker so that they could never get some crazy ideas in their minds to take over the country. And so there was first uh, a, a work, they, the men were, were put into slavery and then because that wasn't working too well, then later they, they killed uh, the baby boys. Uh, he was going to do anything and everything to, to, to dispirit them and weaken them. But instead of that, you know, God still blessed them. But that went on for at least 80 years because Moses was with the, 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 the court of Pharaoh for at least 40 years. And then he went to the wilderness in Midian for 40 years where he got married and, and later would come out of Midian. And so there was at least 80 years when the women were watching their husbands go off as slaves and we're, we're seeing baby boys being killed. A terrible, terrible, horrifying thing. But nothing changed for a long time. And, and God deeply impressed me with something I'd like to share with you this morning. And that was that they were praying, Lord, bless me in Egypt prayers. They were praying, Lord, we like it here. We like life in Ramses. We like tax-free living. We like all the advantages we have. We like Egyptian food. We like our Egyptian houses. We, we like our Egyptian entertainment. We like all of those things. Please deliver us from this slavery. Help us to go back to the happy times we had before. But you see, prophecy said they were to leave Egypt and go back to the promised land. And when we are, when we are praying contrary to God's will, God still answers our prayers, brothers and sisters. But he answers our prayers by causing those prayers to be answered in a negative way. They were praying what I call, Lord, bless me in Egypt prayers. And we need to ask a, a hard question these days. To what degree are we still saying, Lord, deliver me here? Because, you know, going to heaven and, and doing all the things necessary to really be ready for Jesus, you know, that's, that's a bit more than what I want to do. Or are we really saying, Lord, we are choosing to get ready to go to heaven. We're doing what we can to set our minds in the right way and set our relationships in the right way and, and put, make our priorities right and, and let others know so that we can hasten the coming of Jesus. What is it? You know, are, are we praying, bless me here or, or help me get ready to go there? It took them a long, long time to get to the point where they were actually prepared to leave Egypt. It was more than 80 years. And, and you and I wonder, how could that have happened? How could it have taken so long? I cannot explain that, but, but that's how long they were there. And eventually, we read about it in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. It says, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and acknowledged them. All that time, and finally they were praying with a, with a sense of urgency, with a, a sense of desire that God heard. And God, it says, acknowledged them. And the next thing that happens in chapter 3 is Moses is at the, the burning bush. He comes to, uh, to Horeb, the mountain of God. And it says there's an angel of the Lord there in a flame of fire from the midst of a, of a burning bush. And, and God made a statement to him. We read uh, the statement he made in verse 10. He says, and the Lord said, well, let's start in verse 6. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. We know from the writings of Ellen White and other passages of Scripture that this was actually Christ speaking to, to, uh, to Moses. And verse uh, 7 says, And I have seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of the taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. God said, I have heard their cry, I have seen their trouble, and I have come. Verse 8, So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Okay? Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel have come up to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. 
God said, I've heard, I've seen, I know what's going on, and I'm going to send you to bring, notice what the word was, to bring my children, my children out of Egypt. You know, I, I'm encouraged with the thought that God knows what's going on in my life, and you have every right to be encouraged because God knows what's going on in your life. And as you pray, as you seek his face, he, he, he notices and he draws near. But you and I want to be delivered from this oppressive world, right? We want to go to heaven. And I think God knows when we're praying earnestly for that and knows what kinds of ways that he can answer. And then the story continues with the, uh, with the giving of the 10 plagues. And, um, you know, the first three affected everyone, but the next seven did not affect the people in Goshen. God put a protective hand over them, at least for those that, you know, obeyed when they needed to obey and, for example, brought their, 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 their livestock in from the, the plague of, of hail and, and put the blood on the lintel post, you know, when they were told, unless you do that, you know, the firstborn is going to die. Those that obeyed were delivered by God. As a result of all of those things, uh, what I think would have seemed impossible before, the Egyptians said leave and even gave them gifts of gold and silver and other things to take with them. It's a miracle kind of story. And, and, uh, and I think that in some ways, God wants to deliver all of us from the captivity that we can find ourselves in. I say this sincerely and earnestly. But then God led them from what I refer to as bless me in Egypt prayers to a time a progressive journey of dying to self where basically all they could do was self-centered prayers of deliverance. You see, they were, as I said, more Egyptian than, than people of the promised land. And they needed to learn how to obey. They needed to learn to follow God's direction. They needed to learn to accept, you know, God's leadership and God's Sabbath and God's diet and all of those kinds of things. A journey that God takes all of us on. Well, the first thing God did was he, he told them, you better take my word seriously, because if you don't, one of your children is going to die. And brothers and sisters, I believe that we parents have a lot to do with the spiritual condition of our children. And probably one of the great things we could do for our children is to have a true-hearted reformation in our own lives. And I'm speaking for myself, too. But that's what they had to do. And then God began guiding them and God led them what would have appeared to have been in the wrong way, south. The easy road would have been north, but God led them south. They were having to learn to accept God's direction. They were going to have to learn to die to self to accept God's direction. And it's not easy, but brothers and sisters, we must learn to die to self if we want to really walk with God. And God led them. And the Bible says he led them down towards the Red Sea and then he turned them right into a, a natural cove. It was The water was before them. There were mountains on each side, kind of a nice place. And but suddenly someone noticed that the Pharaoh was chasing them from behind and, and, and got afraid. I think that's a natural kind of thing. And God spoke to Moses and told them to, to wield that rod and they went across and they went across on dry ground. And Pharaoh, noticing what was going on, he rushed in, you know, on the dry ground with all of his army, his captains, his chariots, everything like that. And they got on the other side and God said, now, you know, drop the rod. And, and the water came down around the Egyptians and within maybe a minute, maybe two minutes, maybe a little longer, but not very long, the Pharaoh, the army, the captains, the generals, all of their oppressors were dead. They were gone. At most, two or three minutes, they were all dead. Maybe some were on their horses for a while, but, but with the water coming down, I think they all drowned relatively quickly. Who would have ever imagined that God could have delivered them of all of their enemies in such a short amount of time? But notice, it was completely dependent on their obedience. It was completely dependent upon their obedience. My brothers and sisters, you and I can pray all day. And there's a lot to pray about. You could, you could literally spend 24 hours a day just praying about the things that you're aware of in your own life, in, in your own circle of friends, in, in your own you know, community. You could pray all the time. But brothers and sisters, unless we are also obeying and adding obedience to our prayers and to our lives, our prayers, I think, are going to fall short. 
So God led them. They began learning, as I mentioned, all kinds of things as he led them forward. And eventually they came to Kadesh Barnea. They sent spies across. And sadly, though they had learned about obedience, they still lacked the courage. And so instead of going across, they turned into the wilderness. And God took care of them. God took care of them. Their bread, their water was sure, their shoes didn't wear out. We can read that in the Bible. But those were wilderness blessings, not promised land blessings. And many of us today are living on wilderness blessings. I think God wants to give us so much more. But unless we're really prepared to obey, God can't do it. And so they spent, you know, the, uh, the remaining time to fill out 40 years before they finally got to the point where they were prepared to to cross the river and take Jericho. And when they did, you know, they had been exercising by that point. They had developed their own battering rams. They had, you know, a good army all trained. No, none of that. It was the strangest conquest that the Canaanites had ever seen. They just kind of went across and they followed this ark and they, they went around seven times, you know, one time each day, quietly, no noise. The next day, like around the city again, no noise. Next day, another time, no noise. They did this six times. And the seventh day, they went around, I think, seven times. And then at the end, they cried and blew the trumpets. And, and guess what? God brought the walls down. When they were prepared to obey, to persist in obeying, to, to obey specifically the way that God said, without any complaining, there was silence. God was able to win a great, great victory in their lives. So I asked the question, where are you in that journey? Are you still praying, Lord, bless me in Egypt? Are you somewhere on that journey of dying to self, struggling to say, well, you know, should I obey about, you know, the health reform? What about the Sabbath? Uh, you know, should I really try and come into, into a good relationship with other people, you know, or, or and, and stop complaining? Those are the things that, that, that those people had to learn to do in the wilderness. And, and they wouldn't have needed to learn it there. They could have moved right across had they been willing to obey. Now, here's some things to think about. They're very sobering things. Number one, they spent 80 years before they finally decided that they'd had enough of Egypt. I believe God is giving us all good reason to be tired of this world. Brothers and sisters, do all you can to prepare for Jesus to come. Do all you can. Don't, don't be lingering you know, by the flesh pots of this world and by the, the diet of this world and the entertainment of this world because if you do that, you'll be like Lot's wife. You'll be looking back and you may never get out. And then when God says to obey, obey. There's no substitute for obeying. Now it's interesting, God delivered them out of Egypt when they finally left you know, uh, the country and they went to the south and God delivered them from their enemies at the Red Sea. But the biggest problem was not their enemies. It wasn't even the Egyptian oppression when they were slaves. The biggest problem they had was themselves. And that's why they stayed there for 40 years. And that's why of all the people that left, only two, Caleb and Joshua, actually crossed over into the promised land, you know, of the original people that left. Now, I can't speak for you. I can only speak for myself. But brothers and sisters, by the grace of God, we must not only pray, we must live in the way that God can answer those, those prayers. And we must live in such a way that those we're praying for will see that there's something real about the Christianity that we, that we follow. And so, as uh, my brother Prabhu said, not only, you know, prepare for the Sabbath by your cleaning your houses, but your hearts, your relationships, everything about your life. And I need to do the same thing. God is able to win great victories. He'd like to win them quickly. He'd like to deliver us. He'd like to rescue us from this planet. So in your praying, pray earnestly, pray persistently, pray fervently, but then go live earnestly and sincerely and persistently and fervently the life so that God can truly bless your prayers in every way. Let us pray. Father in heaven, this story is rubs close to home. Truth be told, Lord, a lot of us are not happy with the current situation. Because, Lord, you know, it used to be better than it is now, and it's getting harder. Truth be told, Father, this is a toxic planet. It's, it's wasting away. It's deadly to stay here too long. But we've fallen in love with that which is deadly. Drive the love of this world completely out of our hearts. 
draw us into such a relationship with Jesus that we won't want anything else. Help us to turn away from the entertainment, help us to turn away from the other distractions so that we are fully convicted and fully invested in you. And thank you, Father, that you can deliver us from our Egypts, Father. It may be plagues, but you can deliver us. And you can deliver us from our enemies like you did for the children of Israel at the Red Sea. But help us to realize, Father, that we are our biggest problem. Self. Self is the biggest problem. Please do a mighty work for each person here. And Lord, you saw the request. I saw the, the chat requests. People with, with diseases and, and people needing jobs and, and all kinds of things. Answer all of those prayers, Lord. But Please, Father, for all of us and for people all over the world in our church, bring a great revival of primitive godliness, of true godliness, Father. And might it start today with each one of us. Make this a great preparation day and an even better Sabbath day coming. Thank you in Jesus' name with gratitude. Amen. <laughs>